one text as we do on Wednesday night and verse by verse, but we're taking many different scriptures as we're talking about living your call, live your calling. What on earth am I here for? And there is a reason God made you, amen? And there is a call on every one of us as his children to be a part of something that he meant to be created. So let's take our Bibles in hand. We lift them to you, Lord. We just say, speak to us through your word today. You've got seed to drop in our spirits and our heart, Lord, to feed our souls. Lord, we pray that every day that we would take time to look into your word and listen just a little bit. Just spend a little time with you. Five minutes, whatever, God. But give us, give us the, the desire, the grace, desire to seek you more, to look to you. As we head in this march towards Easter, Lord, and celebrating that you're alive and that you've risen us up. Help us, Lord, to live in that life of the Spirit. The Word is life. Your Word is food for us, God. So water us today with your Word. Speak to us. Teach us. And give us the grace and the empowerment to live what we hear, to live our calling, to fulfill the reason you made us and put us on this earth. Thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. God bless you. Good morning to each of you. Keep your Bibles handy. You're, you may be seated. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> Make sure that you have a pen handy to jot some things down. Again, you can take the Bible app of version, and our notes are on there if you have your smartphones or whatever. If not, get the old school pad and pen out and jot a few notes down. And let's learn today. We're looking in this series, and next week it ends. We've only got two more Sunday nights, and it's over. But it's not going to be over as far as living it, amen, and having a new understanding of what God has told us. We're looking at the five callings of our lives, the five purposes of our life, the five reasons God put us on this earth, our five assignments while we're on this earth, and the rest, the real part of our life begins after this testing time on earth. Uh, the word calling, we've learned, is used ten more times than any of the other words, especially more than the word purpose in the Bible. We've looked at the first three callings on our life so far. I've mentioned it, that our first calling in life is to be loved by God. That's why God is love, and he needed someone to give that to. So he created the earth for us. Not us for the earth, but the earth for us to put us on so that he could love us. He is not created us so he could get us, be mean to us, so he could love us and bless us. And that's the first calling that we have is to be loved by God. Your first calling is not to do anything. Your first calling is to receive something from God, which is his love. Then the second calling is that we are called to belong, to be a part of his family. He wants everybody redeemed and blessed and he wanted sons and daughters. He didn't want just creatures. He wanted sons and daughters, those that have his DNA. And then thirdly, if we're of him, then he wants us to become, to be loved, to belong, to become. That was last week's teaching. To become more like him, to mature, to grow up, to become what he wants us to be. This week we're going to look on the fourth calling of our life of why we're on this earth, and that is to bless to bless. Everybody say to bless. We're to bless other people while we're on this earth. Amen? How do you do that? Well, you bless other people when you serve them. When you serve the needs of other people. When you're seeing people around you in need, you want to be a part of that through prayer. Uh, you want to might assist them in a physical way. You might want to help them financially. It might be emotional support. It might be relational support, something practical. There's a thousand different ways that we can bless other peoples. But the Bible calls serving blessing. In fact, the same word is often used in the original language. Is to, to serve is to bless. Bless somebody today. Bless somebody. Serve somebody. Encourage somebody. So when you serve others, the Bible says you actually bless them. Write this down, if you will. The very first point on the message today is the fourth purpose of my life, of course, is to serve others. Through, and when we're serving others, we're serving him. Amen? How many know God doesn't need anything? 
He didn't create us to love him. He created us so he could love us. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. But the original, he didn't need anything. He didn't need us to love him. He is God. He doesn't need anything. We just love him because he loved us. The only need he had was somebody to love and share all that goodness with. And that's why we're here. But the fourth purpose, we'll say it this way of our life, is God shaped me to serve him. And when we serve others, we're serving him. When we give to the kingdom of God, we're giving to him. So that's another, the fourth purpose or reason that we're on this earth. Now, I'm not going to spend, this is not the purpose of my message today other than to, t to tell you our calling and purpose, but I will say this. He shaped us with five different elements, and I'm just going to say them. You can jot them down, and we'll talk about it another time. Many of you have had teaching in, along these lines, but he gave us, when I say he shaped us, he gave every one of us different gifts, spiritual gifts. We each have leanings in our heart, our abilities. We have different abilities that he's given us. That means he shaped us differently. Our personalities are different. Our experiences, our backgrounds are different. These are all the different elements that he has put in our life to shape us to serve him. So we serve him in different ways, with different gifts, with different abilities, with different perspectives. That's how each of us have something to give and something to put into this world that somebody else doesn't have. Amen? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 explains this. It says it this way. And by the way, this is our memory verse this week. So let, why don't we say it aloud together, okay? It's on the screen. Lift your voice real high. And let's put a little extra gumption in it. Cecil ought to have him. He kind of got us going there again, didn't he? He ought to help us read the scripture here today. But let's say it. We read the text first, the address at the first and the end. Here we go. Ephesians 2.10. 2, again, let's read it. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. Okay, how many of you might remember that I preached a few weeks on that particular passage, that we are his workmanship, and you remember that the word in the original language, we are his masterpiece. He shaped us like a work of art. And he made us exactly the way he wanted us to be. And we studied that together. Everybody's unique. We're a work of art. Nobody is like you in the world. And you were created by Jesus, it says, to do good works. Everybody say good works. Now that good work is called your service. It's called your ministry. It's called your blessing that you have to share. That's how you bless people, with good works, okay? It's the way you help other people. It's the way you serve other people. It's the way you bless them and one of the ways you bless God. So, oh, I got to get to church to bless God. You don't have to wait till you get to church to bless God. You bless God by blessing others, by serving other people. God puts you here to make a contribution from your life to somebody else. That is your ministry, and everybody has a ministry. Another word in the Bible for service is ministry, okay? The word servant and the word minister are the same words in the Bible, okay? We need to understand that. Very important concept to get. The word service and ministry are the same words. In fact, we've taught this, but we really need to teach it better. We are all ministers. Everybody in this place, when you go out and somebody says, how many ministers are in your church? Say, the whole church is ministers. Oh, really? It's a Bible school? Yeah, and in a way it is. We're all ministers. Now, I'm an appointed pastor, and I am an administer to the ministers. But I'm not one of the only ministers in this church. Everybody look at somebody and say, you're a minister. Now, a lot of people like to put on top of their name, minister so-and-so. And I go, Ooh, who are you? I had lunch with somebody from this church, Pastor Robbie and me. And they're not a, well, I won't tell you where they're at. They're in the building, but they're not in service today. They're working, doing some stuff here. And uh, Pastor Robbie just came out and said, he said, I noticed you said minister so-and-so on your Facebook page. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't realize you're a minister. Yeah, he said, I'm ordained. I said, who ordained you? He said, the Internet. <laughs> and I laughed my head. I almost cried. I laughed. I never, ever heard anybody admit it. You know, oh, the Internet. I said, but you don't need the Internet. God ordains you. Everybody's a minister, and you don't have to have the title. In fact, I know lots of folks that have titles that don't minister. I remember 
when we first opened this church, we had a lot of new people coming in, and, and, and it's wonderful to have new people, and, and many of them are still here. We're so grateful for that. But a lot of people want to make things the way that they, they've been brought up. It should be and just letting people do different things, and that's great with me. I have no problem with it. But people started they started sitting down here, here, let me take your Bible. You know, treating me a certain way. Oh, well, okay, th- thank you. I appreciate it. Take, t- take my Bible. Walking me up here and doing all this stuff. And after a while, I thought, it just didn't seem right. And I'm not, t- if you're from that background, God bless everybody. I'm not here to criticize anybody, but something just didn't feel right. I thought, you know what? I can carry my own Bible. I- I'm not some prince and king and, and, and you know, they, here, here these, these seats are for you. And, and I thought, no, I'm just fine down there. And I started, started thinking about what Jesus said. He said, you know, I didn't come into the world to be served. I came to serve. That's my ministry is not to be a king and something great. And I can carry my Bible. And I appreciate help. In fact, we can use a little bit more of practical stuff. Showy stuff just doesn't do anything for me. I don't need to be told, you, you know, if I'm, if I'm a minister, I'll minister. I don't have to have a title. I don't have to look a certain way. I just do it. And people really will respond to that. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But everybody's a minister. Everybody say, I am a minister. And that's very, very important to get it. Now, write this down. This is another very important concept. These are basic things in Christianity that we, in our culture, have left out. We think that we Christians are called to be entertained and to be blessed. The only reason you get blessed is to be a blessing. It's not just so you'll be more comfortable and you'll have more money and you'll feel better. That is not godly, biblical Christianity. That is cultural Christianity, but it's not Bible Christianity. You are to be blessed. I'm going to get me a blessing. Well, what are you going to do with it is what I want to know. So there's a reason why we're blessed. Write this down. It's a very important concept. My life calling is to be a bivocational minister of Jesus. My Life calling is to be a bivocational minister of Jesus. Now, I'll have to explain this to you. What is, first of all, what does bivocational mean? It's like bifocals. How many of you know glasses? Or you have bifocals. You, you get glasses, and that means you, two, you see two things at one time, okay? You can see far away, and you can see fo- fo- close up. Now, when I had LASIK surgery... They made my eyes in a bifocal kind of way. I, my left eye is for reading close up or for looking close up. My right eye was for distance. And then it all comes together. I see two things at one time. They're, it's bifocal. Now, most of you know that I've had something happen to my right eye. I thought I was going blind for a while, but a disease hit it. And if I look at you, I can see like William down here. I can see him from the neck up, and everything below that is dark, and I can't see. So it's messed it up a little bit, and so I have to re- have glasses now to read because it, it's all a little bit weird. So I'm going to actually go back to the doctor and, and uh, get them all fixed up again. So you, you adjust to whatever you have to adjust to. Your eyes adjust. And that's the way it is in life. Some lot, things are not perfect in life, but how many of you know we adjust? Just like my eyes have adjusted now, and basically I don't need any other glass and help. Are you all with me? So we adjust to life, and different things happen. But when it first happened, I, I, my kids were crying, my dad's going blind. And y'all, how many of you always believe the worst at first? And then you trust the Lord, and he works it all out. And I'm still here and still reading. Occasionally I squint, but I'm still reading and preaching, and God is good. Amen? But that's what bi-vocational bi- means. Now, what I'm saying to you is that you, what you do are for two basic reasons. Bi is two. So you can do these things at the same time. Two basic reasons, and not one reason, but two basic reasons. You're a bivocational minister. First of all, who's the ministers in this church? Now, we got pastors, but they're, everybody's a minister. Everybody has a calling. And you don't have to put a name on yourself. You just are. If you go to this church, we believe the Bible, and it says everybody's a minister. Okay? So we don't need special parking places for anybody. We don't need anybody to carry you a Bible in. I even mean, we're all ministers. Everybody say, we're all ministers. Okay, everybody has something that they're supposed to be doing. And we're bivocational ministers of Jesus Christ. 
And by vocationalist, we do two things at the same time. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're a truck driver, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a baker, whether you're a homemaker, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a factory worker. It does not matter. Any of those things. Everybody, everybody, say everybody, is a bivocational minister. Okay? Every single person. And you're a Christian and you're here to do two things, two reasons you're here. Number one, we're here to help others. And two, we're here to honor God. Not just here, I mean on the earth. So everything we do is to help others. Secondly, the next thing, and not secondarily, but just secondly, is to honor God. So whatever I do when I go to work on Monday morning is to honor God. I'm alive, and I'm honoring God with what I do. And secondly, to help people, to help the company, to help my boss, to help the store, to help whatever I do, and to help anybody that I work with along this life's way. Now, yeah, I make money, and I have to live, but that's not my primary reason for being on the earth. It's just to make money and do stuff for me. And the more I help others and honor God, the more raises I'm going to get, the more favor I'm going to have because my heart's right and my attitude's right and my priorities are right. So two basic things, to honor God, to help others. Let's say honor God first. That sounds a little bit better, doesn't it? That, that's the first thing, right? Honor, always honor God. So no, it doesn't matter. I can honor God and take out the trash. I can be a garbage collector, and that's my job. And a lot of people are saying, you could be a minister garbage collector. Smile at people. How you doing today, man? Bless people as you pick up their trash. There's no shame in that. It's a job. I'd rather people, I'd rather do that than sit at home and say, I ain't got nothing to do. You won't do anything. Sometimes. Now, I don't mean if you, if you need a job, it's not, that's not the situation. But you understand what I'm talking about. Don't put people down because their vocation is different than you. Everybody, if they're honoring God and they're helping others and ministering the way that God says, then they're blessed and highly favored. Amen? And we honor everybody where they're at. Come on, amen. That's, that's Bible teaching. So, honor God, say it again, honor God, and help others. Everything I do in life, I'm a follower of Jesus, in bivocational, it's bivocational. I have a job, but in that job, I'm honoring God, and I'm helping others. Everybody make this, that make sense? That should be our attitude. We have caught up with the the get rich stuff, and I got to have this, and I got to have that, and it's all about me. That's not why you're put on this earth. God did not put you and me on this earth for life just to be about us. For us to just make as much money as we have and get as much stuff as we can and feel good ourselves. In fact, people that all they think about is themselves are really the most miserable people on the earth. Life is not full and abundant and rich and they don't know what's wrong. It's because they're always, uh, they're always on, uh, somebody said, I'm always on my mind. Well, that's true of all of us, isn't it? We're always thinking about ourselves and how we feel and how it would affect us and what will I do if, if I, I'm going to help them, but how will it affect me? I've got, you know, we're, all, we're always on our mind. So that's not a problem. We all have that in us, and that's that, you know, that survival instinct within ourselves. But we cannot, real, we cannot just look to ourselves. Anything that is just about itself dies. Even in the natural world, you, do, you have a water pool or, a, or something, and all it is, it's self-contained, it will end up dying. It, you know, it has to have fresh water put in it. It has to have the rain. Something must go in if, and then be released if it's going to be alive and fresh. Or else it dies and it becomes dead. It becomes a cesspool is all it does. Amen? Now, the Bible says it like this, Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do, say whatever you do. Whether in word or deed, you don't have to say it anymore. I mean, just the first few words. Thank you, though. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all, do it all, say all, all of it in life, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It says whatever you do, it can be a ministry. It can be a blessing if you honor God and you help others. Whatever you do, you do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, it says. Taking out the garbage, changing dirty diapers, all of those, that can be a ministry. Cleaning the living room, amen? Making a deal and a business deal of some kind. I could help somebody across the street, whatever it is. Everything in your life can become a ministry if I do it to honor God and to help others. And you'll end up making money. 
Somebody says, if you want to make a lot of money, do what you love. That's because you're passionate about it. And therefore, God will bless you. And, and that's the way it is. Honor God and help others. If you go, oh, God, I'm going to work, and this company just makes me sick. I don't, but you better get a, a job that you can believe in, and you'll help them. Or if you see something you don't believe in, try to help change it. And if you can't change that, and you see they're not going to do it, find one that you, your gifts are appreciated. But our job is not just to endure, make our money, go home and forget it and talk about them. Our job is to honor God, do everything we have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to, sir, and to help others, to help our boss, to help our company, to help other people. Y'all understanding this so far? This is practical teaching, but it's very important. This is the right motivation for living on this earth. This is why we are, what we're called to do, called to be loved, called to belong. Because we need encouragement to do what we're doing. Called to become like him and called to bless or to serve. That's the reason that we're here. Now, this isn't in the notes, but write it down. It's just something a little extra I'm going to give you. Menial tasks become meaningful tasks when we do it out of our love for God. Menial tasks become meaningful tasks when we do it out of a heart that loves God. No longer is it just going through the motions, but we're doing this for the Lord. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's the right motivation. So everything in your life becomes significant. There are no days that aren't significant. Everything is a significant day. Even if you're taking a day off and relaxing, you'll run up to somebody that might need to be blessed. Need somebody to take a little time to talk to them, to help them, to encourage them, to give them something. Whatever it is, life is about honoring God and helping others. Are you with me? Now, let's say you're in a meeting in an office where you work, and all of a sudden the meeting is over, and everybody gets walks, and walks out, but all the coffee cups and the, and the plates where the donuts were on and all that stuff, all that trash is left. You know how you could be a blessing? Well, everybody else walks up and leaves because somebody else will do that. You wait and pick up all the trash. You just kind of stick it. Just take you a few minutes just to be a little extra help and a blessing to somebody. That's what I'm talking about. That's the difference of people that follow this motivation and those that just expect everybody to serve them. See what I'm saying? We're here to help others and to honor God. If you picked up the paper and the napkins, you've just done a ministry. Then maybe you can say minister so-and-so on your front name. Not because you paid $20 to the Internet and the Internet ordains you. I love that. That's my favorite thing I've learned this week. I was ordained by the Internet, Pastor. Really? <laughs> I love it. Love it, love it. In fact, you know, if I want to really get down to Bible stuff, the calling to salvation, when he called you, Jesus told the disciples, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Not only were you called to salvation, when you were called to salvation, you were also called to serve. You weren't just called to come and believe in Jesus, but you were called to serve with Jesus and for Jesus. Are you with me? So not just called to be saved, you're called to serve. You're saved to serve is a good way to put it. Everybody say, I'm saved to serve. So we ought to be different. Our attitudes ought to be different. We don't walk into the room. Somebody, says, somebody said in, in statistics tell us that Sunday is the day every server and every waiter hates to serve on Sunday because Christians are coming. The people that think they're highly favored and ought to be served. We hadn't read our Bible right. The reason we're highly favored is we're going to be blessed. We have a better attitude. We've got a little more in our pocket because God's given us a little extra. He's, our cup's overflowing, and we're there to bless. Not just be blessed, but to bless. Does that make sense? Is that Bible? See, our value systems got all mixed up. Look at Galatians 1.15. It says this. God in his grace chose me even before I was born. We've been hearing a lot about that. And called me to serve him. That's our calling. Called me to serve him. Circle that phrase or jot it down. He called me to serve him. This is our fourth purpose of our life. Fourth calling on our life. We're called to serve. We're shaped to serve. He gave everybody different gifts and different personalities and different experiences. 
They weren't made for you to be ashamed. They were made for you to help somebody else who might be going through that. You're shaped to serve. You're made for ministry. You're called to bless. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to share the remainder of our time here just real quickly, but I've only got four points today. Somebody said, hallelujah, because I've been going seven, eight. Only four points today. And I want to share with you the four incredible benefits that happen in your life. All right, I'm supposed to do that. But there are benefits for you. God never tells you to do something that there's not benefits for others and yourself. When you follow God, you're always blessed. When you do what God says, God's way, you're always blessed. You're always better for honoring God and doing it the way his word tells us to do. So there are four incredible benefits for your life that change your focus from self to service. Now, I feel like I'm going upstream in this culture. If I was preaching a message today, how you can get blessed and get your needs met and get more money and get more happy, woo, you'd be shouting and waving hankies all over the building. But I'm teaching you the Bible, how to serve others. And actually, I'm telling you how to have a happy life, how to be fulfilled, how to be rich in all things, is to do it God's way. But that's not the way the world teaches it, and sadly, the principles of the world have come into the church. And so we're telling everybody, come and get from God what you want. Remember the old song, if you, uh, what's that one? I don't know how it goes, but basically you remember it. Call him up and tell him what you want. <laughs> main, on the, Jesus on the main line, there you go. I was raised in those kind of songs. We shout and shout, and then we all run around the church and we get what we want. We get our blessing and go out and be mean as the devil all week long, walk in the restaurants and expect to be. But we never were taught the Bible. We just were taught an experience. And we told him what we want because life's about us. How many of you know that's the prevailing principle even in church today if we're not careful? But I hadn't be Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Amen? You've got something somebody else doesn't have. Yeah, I know, but I'm still miserable. Well, that's because you're, you know what? Miserable, it's not an accident that the word miserable and miser are connected. We're miserable when we're misers and, and everything's about me and my problem and my need and my wants. And I told him what I want and I didn't get it. You see what I'm saying? Life doesn't work that way. I'm telling the truth. We're laughing a little bit, but sometimes the truth hurts, doesn't it? And I got to realize if, if I'm not happy, maybe life's too much about me. I remember when I was going through something and I was down and I went to some counseling because I'd had it with church. I'd had it with religion. I'd, I'd messed up and life was just miserable. Everything was falling apart. And I, I sat before professionals and I talked to them and I said, I, what am I supposed to do now? And they said, I know you're hurting and I know you're down. Find somebody else that's hurting a little bit more than you and help them. Because I felt like my days of helping and serving were over. It's done. It's over. Who am I now? What am I? What am I supposed to do? Find somebody. Best advice anybody ever gave. Find somebody that's down a little lower than you, that's hurting a little more than you, and help them. And suddenly, you'll realize that when you're helping them, you're helping yourself. And that you're pulling yourself up and out because you're doing what God would have done. Find somebody worse off. There's always somebody in a worse place than you are. Help them. Seed into them. Water them. And God will see that you're watered. And I'm here today as a result of planting a seed in a famine in my life. And I felt like I didn't have anything to say. How many of you have ever been there? If you haven't, you haven't really lived. Because we all have a place where we just say, it's over. I can't do this anymore. I can't do that. How many of you have ever said, I can't do this anymore? It might have lasted for some of you two minutes. Some of us, it, some people, it lasts two years. But we've all had that feeling in life before. I don't know how I can go any further. I don't know how I can do this. I don't know how I can raise these kids. I don't know how I can make this money. I don't know how I can meet these bills. I don't know how I can look in the mirror. We've all been there. Life is funny, but it ain't no joke, somebody said. It's real. And we all have to know the right principles of why it's not working. And once I learn them, it'll work if you work it. You can know it, but if you don't, don't work what you know, it will work if you work it. But it won't work just because you know it. Now, I tell you, take a pen and, and pad and write it down. But just because you write it down doesn't mean you 
are going to be able to work it. You're going to work it out in your life. And sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it takes time to understand. I, I did that. Well, I guess I did it wrong. I didn't do it the right way. I told him I was sorry. Yeah, but your attitude was so bad, you made it worse. You can do the right thing in the wrong way, and it's a negative instead of a positive. I told him I was sorry. I told him I was wrong. I told him I had a part in it. I know, but there wasn't any tenderness. There wasn't any openness. There wasn't any teachability. There was condemnation. You're still mad at him. And that's all they heard was your anger. See what I'm saying? So God's all about heart, not about just performing. You can do all the religious stuff in the world and have a wrong heart, and you still don't get blessed. I've been giving for five years, and I ain't got a thing back. Well, maybe your attitude's wrong. The Bible says God loves what kind of a giver? Still old. God's always about the heart. That's the issue, okay? Now, let's get these benefits and get out of here. I'm talking too much. First thing that happens, serving others unselfishly will create joy in my life. Serving others unselfishly will create joy in my life. I mean, massive amounts of joy come from serving. The happiest you'll ever be is when you've done something for somebody else. Most people are looking for happiness today in all the wrong places. They're looking for happiness in, ple in pleasure and in power and in possessions and in position and in prestige. That's how they're, they're going to be happy. And they might be happy for a season, but it doesn't last. I mean, know some of the richest people in the world at the finest houses and mansions and cars and people, everything they want. For a season, they were happy, but how many of you found out it doesn't last? We want something, a happiness and a joy that will last, amen? And that joy, that permanent kind of joy, comes from serving, by giving my life away so he can use me. You're wired for that. You're shaped for that. You are on this earth, not just to live for yourself, but you might be a glory to God, an honor to God, and help other people. That's the reason we're here. If there's no reason for us to, to do that, God, why not? God, just the minute you're saved, boom, you died and go right to heaven. Why stay on this earth? This earth is not our home. There's a battleground here. Satan is here. This is, he's the prince of the power of the air. There's battles. Why do I go through all that stuff? Does God just want to torment me? No, if you'll get your eyes off of you and help somebody else, then you'll realize your purpose in life, and you'll have a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it's not just about you. We have rough days, but the thing that keeps me going is I have a call on my life, and you have a call on your life. We're all ministers, and we're not here just to endure life, but to make it better for somebody else, and that fulfills me. I have a getting up morning feeling because I know somebody else might need me. I have a purpose for living. And it's not just for me to be more comfortable. It's for me to have more character so I can help somebody else get through what they're going through. Ultimately find Christ in their life and find a purpose for their life and a reason they're on this earth and that they can live with a goal in mind and that heaven is our home. We're just passing through this life. Then it begins to put, come together, and it has meaning, and it has purpose. But if you spend all your time thinking about you, you do that naturally anyway. And how can I feel better, and how can I have this? And I, you will be a miser and a miserable person. Am I preaching the truth? So, most people don't know two secrets of joy. Two secrets for joy. Secrets. They're secrets because if people do them, <laughs> they wouldn't be a secret anymore. Number one, the first secret of joy is get the focus off myself. I've already said that a thousand times today. Shift the focus from inward focus, all about me, to outward focus, all about God and helping others. Okay? And this is a counterculture thing I'm saying. How many of you realize you don't hear this on TV? Hi, buy this product and serve others. No, buy this product and feel good about yourself. Only $549, you know, all that stuff. A good example of, of what I'm saying, joy flows into your life. The more you give your life away and he uses you, the more joy comes in your life. Paul said it this way, Philippians 2.17. He says, my life is being poured out as a part of the sacrifice and service, there's the word, I offer to God for your faith. 
Yet, he says this in spite of sacrifice and service. He says, yet I am filled with joy and I share that joy with all of you. It's a fact of life that the most helpful people are the most happy people. Amen? If you want to be happy, you got to be helpful. But sit and pout and nobody talk to me. You didn't talk to anybody else. How many of you know you look at people, they walk in the door, and you look at them, and it says, I dare you to say hello to me. And I usually go to those people and say hello. And they look back and glare at you like, how dare you? Come on, have you seen that? Or maybe you've been that way before. If you're unhappy, it might be because you're self-centered. You're thinking too much about yourself. It's just the way the universe works. You've got to give out to get in. Amen? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, always be full of the joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are unselfish and considerate in all you do. There you have the connection. Joy, serving, blessing. Are you with me? Unselfish, considerate, joy. Inconsiderate, selfish, sad, down, depressed. See the difference? Philippians 2.4, another scripture. It says, let it, but don't, don't put it up yet because I don't want them to see that part, but look at this. You know what it says in the, in the New King James. It says, let each of you look out not only for himself, his own interest, but also for the interests of others. You've read that. <laughs> I, like this, I like this paraphrase. Now you can put it up. It says, forget about yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Boy, that's blunt, isn't it? <laughs> forget about yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. If there's lack of joy in your life, you're not happy right now, start serving. It's what they told me when I was down, okay? If you're down, find somebody that's more down. And when you help healing them, you'll heal yourself. In other words, you can only think about your problem and yourself for so long. And nothing's going to change until you change. It's the only thing I know to do is find somebody else that's hurting. That's why sometimes pastors and real ministers, and we're all ministers... The effective ministers are not the perfect ones that wait until they get perfect. In fact, I had messed up in my life. It just seemed everything was falling apart. And one guy said, look, if you ever wait until you think you're perfect and worthy to serve again, that's when you don't have the qualifications to serve. Now, quit thinking about yourself and where you've been. Now, they said it nicer than this. But, but they said, quit just thinking about yourself and get up. You're wounded, but be a wounded healer and start healing people. Start speaking to people's lives and loving them again. But I don't. Me, 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 me. But I don't. Let's quit that. Get up. Be wounded. It's okay to be wounded. But quit thinking about it and focusing on it and whining about it and licking your wounds and infecting them all over again. Just go ahead and heal somebody else even though you're not perfect and you're wounded. Just do it. And you'll end up being healed. Does that make sense? That's not what the world would say to you. And, and yeah, we have need times off, but we also don't need to stay down. We get down, but don't stay down. Some of us have been down for years. We've been down so long, we don't even remember what it was like to be up. That's not going to help us. Okay, I got to go. I'm talking a lot today. Somebody say, what's new, Pastor? What's new? Okay. Number one, the first secret of joy, get the focus off of ourselves, okay? Number second secret of joy is when I use my gifts to help others. You have gifts for a reason. Yes, I got a trophy because I did. That's not why you got your gifts. So you could get a trophy and you could get a certificate. That's nice to be encouraged, but that's not your purpose. Your gift is to help other people, and you have joy by helping other people, and you do it to honor God. Are you with me? 1 Peter 4.10 says this. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to make a ton of money. Oh, excuse me, that's not what it says. That was part of the reviled substandard version, wasn't it? That's not it. No. It says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. It's all through the Bible, isn't it? We're blessed to be a blessing. All right, let's go to the second thing, second benefit of serving and doing what God says. It will improve my relationships. And boy, do we need this one because we got relationship problems in America, don't we? Your relationships will get better when you learn how to serve. See the needs of other people, the hurts of other people. And that's something 
you've got to practice that. None of us are really good at that. We have to practice it. The root, now there are other issues, but the root of relational problems, there are other issues, I'm not saying there aren't, but the root of relational problems is self-centeredness. It really is. There are other issues, but the root is that. I want what I want when I want it, and you want what you want when you want it. And we butt heads. And neither of us are willing to budge and give in and change. I want my way, you want your way. So we've got a problem, okay? Proverbs 13 and 10 says this. Only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride, stubbornness. It's my way or the highway. You've got to have it. It's ego. And we won't break and we won't bend. And you live long enough that you don't, it doesn't really matter. Don't be wrong about being right. So what? I could do it better. So what? I still think my way's right. So what? You, when you live long enough, you choose your battles. When you're young, you have to fight everything. The older you get, the wiser you get. You go, I think that's stupid, but it doesn't matter. They'll learn, whatever. And maybe you might learn from them. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. I don't know lots of stuff. The longer I live, the more I know I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. Your relationships get better. It's a lifelong thing, but relationships begin to get better. We need to get out of ourselves and take it. You know, relational counselors will tell us that, okay, you see it from your point of view, and you feel it's right, but just for a second... Try to see it from their point of view and see what they think. And then you begin to see a different side. Oh, I didn't know you looked at it like that. Because we're all different. We're shaped differently. And that's the thing that relational problems are all about. So most people go through life living for themselves instead of living their calling. Amen? And God puts you here. To learn unselfishness. And it's a lifelong process of learning not to think of it just your way. Why? Because God is love and God wants us to learn to be like him. He didn't come here to serve and have you see it his way. Yeah, he wants you to do it, but he also wanted to see it their way. That's why the woman caught in adultery, he didn't say, you, you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, she shouldn't be doing it. She's not going to be happy living that kind of life. That's why at the end, she, he said, go and sin no more. Not at the beginning. He reached down and saw it her way. You're hurting. You're looking for love in the wrong places. And he didn't start condemning her and beating her up. He did tell her to go and not do it anymore. Go a different direction. That's not going to work. Going with all these men and doing all that, that's not the way to live. But that was the last thing he said. And today in the church, that's the first thing we said. And we're known for what we don't believe in instead of what we do believe in. We do need to teach some things you should not do. The Bible says don't do this. Don't. It does give us direction. And those things need to be taught. Can somebody say amen? But that's not the first thing you ought to hear from somebody trying to tell you about Jesus. Jesus says don't do that. Really? And that's the only message some people have of Christ in the church. That's all we're known for. There are those things, but that's to children of God, not the unbelievers. See, everybody is a human being. Everybody's created by God, but everybody's not a child of God. We're all children of God. That's not biblical. Everybody's not a child of God. Everybody's not a son or daughter of God. The Bible says you must be born again. And then you become a child of God. Everybody's created by God. He's their creator, but he's not the lover of their soul. Nobody loves me like mama and daddy. See, that's a totally different kind of love than a person that has created you. So they're created, but they're not in the family. And we've already talked about family things. Are you all with me now? Okay. We're talking about being, being joyful because we're... Interest, we're interested in helping other people. So we're going to have better relationships. Amen? Amen? Matthew 20, 28. Your attitude must be like my own, Jesus says, for I did not come to be served, but to serve. Don't try to be, somebody said one time, don't try to be interesting, be interested. That's good. 
Don't go to a party. Ooh, I'm looking good. I'm interesting. Take a look at me. No, no, no. Don't be interesting. Be interested. If you'll go to a party, it really doesn't matter how you're dressed. You're interested in other people, and you ask them about themselves, and you want to help serve them. You'll have people all around you. That guy can talk. That guy really is interesting. They'll think you're interesting because you're interested in them because everybody's selfish. If you're interested in their needs, the needs, needs of others, they'll be interested. Your relationships will be better off. Romans 14, 18 says, if you serve Christ in this way, unselfish serving, you will please God and be respected by people. The scriptures in New King James says, you'll be acceptable to God and approved by men if you're interested in them. So the more I bless other people, the more God blesses me. The more I serve other people, the more God honors me. Amen? The more I minister to others, the more God ministers to me. Are you hearing me? Proverbs eleven twenty five: The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Amen? People say, you know what? I'd like to be involved and serve some way, but I'm just too busy. Well, that's fine. I know you're an important person and all that kind of thing. That's very, very good. But I just want you to know that you just forfeited the blessings of God in your life because you're too busy. I don't know about you. I need the blessings of God in my life. And the way they come is I take time to serve, to serve him and worship him and to get involved and just volunteer for something. Just do something for somebody else to help out. And God will bless. Proverbs eleven seventeen. 17. I got to go. I'm not, I'll quote a lot of scripture, but this is important. You do yourself a favor when you're kind. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You do yourself a favor when you are kind. Proverbs. Another one. Proverbs 22 and 9. And then we're going to go to the next one. Almost done. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 9, a generous man will himself be blessed. That's what I read earlier. You, you water, you'll be watered. All right, let's go to the third one, the third benefit of serving and blessing other people. Serving others unselfishly will make my life, my life, meaningful. How many of you know everybody wants to, when they've lived, let somebody remember that they were there? Somebody sang it on American Idol, one of the songs. I want them to remember I was here. They might not know all about, but I was here. I made a mark in life. I made a difference in my part of the world. I can't change the whole world, but I can change my part of the world. I can touch my family. I can touch my neighbors. I can help my church. You hearing what I'm saying? It's a very important surprise that meaning in life comes from giving and serving others. Meaning, meaningful lives don't come from money. They come from serving. They come from giving. Well, if I can just get more money, then my life will have more meaning. No, it will not. A lot of rich people will say money will help you. Money makes it easier, takes some pressure off. It opens doors. It does things that some other things can't do. But no amount of money will give your life meaning. It can do some things, but meaningful lives is not what money will do. In fact, most people that win the lottery, oh, if I win the lottery, Pastor, we're going to bless this church. Right. Been saying that ever since I've pastored. I've pastored some 30 years. I ain't had no lottery winners yet. I have a lot of dreamers. I don't have any lottery winners. And even if we did, you know what happens. All those, even, even NFL players, they make millions, and they end up on skid row with not a dime to their name because we get this money, and we think it will last forever, and it gives me meaning and happiness, and we end up spending it and splurging it on everything, and we don't have anything left. Lottery winners end up, end, end up with nothing because they don't know how to use it. So we don't get meaningfulness out of money. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, well, let me go. Mark 8, 35 says this. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life, here's our point of serving, for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. Everybody say true life. Give your life away, you'll get it back. You hold on to it, you lose it. There's no meaning in my life because you tried to spend all your time looking at you. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Always give yourselves fully, say fully, to the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is never wasted. Amen? There, notice a couple of words in that word. A, a couple of words in that verse. It, always, it says always give yourself fully. The word in Greek means not half-hearted. 
That means everything, if everything you're doing, you're doing for the Lord, you don't do anything half-hearted. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Amen? Okay. I hope you're getting something out of this. This is, this is good stuff. This can change our lives. It'll change the way you get up in the morning and go to work. It'll change the way you deal with that person that's irritating in the next stall or the next, next booth or whatever it is that they're sitting next to you. It'll change everything about everything. Because I'm here to honor God and help other people. Amen? Okay, the fourth and then last thing, and I'm done. The last thing, the last benefit of helping others, living unselfishly, is it will leave a legacy. Don't you want to leave a legacy? Sometimes I don't have any money. To, you don't have to leave money. The richest, the best thing that you can have is memories of a mom and a dad that loved and served and blessed. I want people to remember, man, he worshiped God. He wanted to honor God. He didn't do everything perfect. He messed up a lot, but he had a heart that wanted to help people, and he did things for people, and he honored God with his life. As imperfect as it was, you leave a legacy. Amen? You'll leave a mark. Actually, you leave two legacies, one on earth and one in heaven. The one on earth passes away, but the one on heaven, you're getting rewarded, and it'll go on and on and on and on and on forever. Amen? Proverbs 10, 7 says this. Good people will be remembered as a blessing. What kind of a reputation will you have when you're remembered? Man, they were always down. They were always depressed. Or will they remember that you as, I'll tell you what, they went through all kinds of stuff. They weren't perfect. But they were always a blessing. When I needed them and when, I, when, when, when it really counted, they were a blessing to me. Is that what you want to be known by? I think it is, isn't it? Every one of us. We don't want to be self-centered. And a legacy also is, is about how we pass things down to others and teach them. Teach our children to give. You know, I think that your children should see you write out your tithe check or your grace gifts and say, you know what? The reason we give this to the church, the reason we give this in honor of the Lord is at one time, dad and mom didn't follow Jesus. There was a time in our life that we were like the, ch the children of Egypt. We, they were slaves and they were bound. And, but Jesus set us free and he changed our life. And so we're trying to do things God's way. And he tells us to give and we'll be blessed. And that's why we have this house. And that's why we have a job. And that's why God, God's blessed us. And that's why we give what we give. Now, the real good parents don't just show them what they do and model it, but they teach them how to do it too. We've got some families in this church. There's one family that sends their tithe in, and they got three kids, and every one of their kids have their own envelope, and they put it out to, to the pet, 45 cents, whatever, $10.45 $10 or whatever it is that they got. They're taught to tithe. And their children. In fact, this last week from that family, we got one, you know, three kids, but one of them must have got an extra job or done something because they sent in $4.50 extra in their envelope and had their name on it, Destiny Church Finance Department. I like that. That's good. $4 and whatever. They're being taught. What are your children being taught? Oh, the television teaches them. I know. That's the problem. The war games and the fight, the video games teach them. I know. We need to teach them the things of God. We need to be faithful to the house of God. We need to, to leave a legacy. Amen? Leave a legacy. Let's pray. Oh, God, help us to respond to this message in three ways. God, I pray that we would respond to serving as it relates to my church what am i doing to honor the house of god the kingdom of god to help this church reach the community and to be a part of that how can i bless the community through my church secondly how can i bless my family by serving them better teaching my children sharing with them being an example to them serving my spouse my mom my dad my brothers my how can i serve them and thirdly, how can I serve myself and be a better person? How can I encourage myself and bless me emotionally? God, it's not going to sit and whine and talk about how nobody serves me. People can even hear this message, God, and they can think of it, nobody serving me instead of me serving others. God, as a pastor, I felt like at times I've served everybody and there isn't anybody that cares about me. And you got me off that, that strange wreck real quick. Because life isn't about me. And if, even if nobody else does something for me, you always show up some way. 
or send somebody from somewhere else. You take care of your people if we do it your way. God, help us here as it relates to the church, as it relates to our family, and as it relates to ourselves. And help us to serve. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you just give us just a few more minutes when you stand? Will you not just, oh, I've heard it and I'm out of here. Try to hang with the whole church. Let's stand together. Let's just stand together. give myself away so you can Come on, catch the spirit of what we said. I give myself away. That's what Jesus said will make you happy. That's what we got to do. I give myself away so you can use me oh i give myself Come on, sing it out. away Ooh. i give myself away so you would you give us just a couple of days a couple of minutes just a couple of minutes everybody just walk everybody just come down to the front just a couple of minutes we're going to worship a second we're going to have a prayer of dedication god changed my life Help me get involved in something that's not just about me. Amen. Amen. Come on, everybody, just press in as close to the front as you can. Here I stand, Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I long to see your desire. Reason I'm here, Lord. Your desire for me when you made me. Give myself away. Come on, let's lift our hands and hearts and surrender to Him, Lord. Oh, I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. Sing it again. I give myself away. Oh, I give myself away. Help me give it away. Oh, I give myself away. So you can use me. Oh, I give myself away. I give myself away. Let's do the verse just one more. Can use me. Here I am. Here we are at the altar. Here I am. Here in the Word of God. Here in the reason Lord, we were made. My life is, in my life is yours, Lord. I'm not here for me, I'm here for you. Lord, I'm to Help me fulfill my purpose, God. Your desire. Your desire. What's his desire? Let's do it. Come on, tell me. Oh, I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. just say this we're, we're done when I was down everything was about me and it almost seemed cruel when my counselor said get up and help somebody else I almost resented it for a minute and maybe you're hearing this today and you got so many needs and you're saying hold it what about me I've said that if not verbally in my head many times don't take what was told to you today and preached and what Jesus said as, as being uncaring and uns insensitive because God cares for you that's the first thing he put you on this earth for so we could love you but he knows if everything is inward and about you even though you're hurting right now you've got to at least for a while take part of your attention off of your situation your need and your busyness and just give a portion of it 
of serving somebody else, helping somebody else, helping the kingdom. You have an opportunity Easter. Why do we do what we do? We don't have time. We're busy. We've got things to do. We don't have the money to go out and buy all these thousand, fifteen thousand eggs. How's that going to save anybody? You'd be surprised. People don't care what you know until they know you care. We're sir, there's a one grandpa he came, in his 80s and he came in this week and took him five minutes, ten minutes to get out of his car and get into the church. But his question was, are y'all having that egg hunt this year? Yes, sir, we are. Well, I bring 13 of my grandchildren every year, he said. And I just, it's hard on me getting out and I didn't want to get out and bring them if you weren't going to have it because they'd get disappointed and it, it, it's hard on me in this time of life. But we're going to have, th this year we're bringing 17 because they're bringing some friends. I said, yes, sir, we're going to have it. It means a lot to people to serve people, to love people. I hope you had a good time. We invite them to church. We love them. It's planting seed. It's caring about somebody just than us. We need people to hide eggs. Every year I get scared because I'm the first one here almost, and there ain't nobody here. And I go, oh, my God, I can't hide the 15,000 eggs. But everybody shows up. And we always appreciate everybody that helps. People park the cars, don't they, Lenny? We need people to park cars, to just stand and greet people. This sanctuary is filled. There's hundreds of people that come from all over. And we just give ourselves away. And it blesses people. And it touches them. For some people, that's the best sermon that they need to hear. They don't need to hear, you're not supposed to do this. You're, they don't want to hear. They just want somebody to love them. And then we'll tell them how to live and the ways we're to do it. And it's a real good chance to do it be involved in some way and God will bless you may the Lord bless every one of you and keep you may his grace be multiplied to you may his face shine upon you and give you peace and happiness and may you do what he told you to do keys to happiness secrets that other people don't see because the world says it's all about you it's what you need and what you it isn't the most happy people I know give their lives to other people and serve. Amen. Have a great day. Hope I'll see some of you tonight. The rest of you.